Hello, good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone, depending on where you're at. Um, and welcome to the first uh, webinar in our new uh, Collective Impact webinar series. Our topic today um, is Thinking and Acting Differently, the Collective Impact Opportunity. And we are excited to, to present some introduction to, to you and, and really to kick off this new initiative uh, at USBC. Um, I am Megan Renner, the Executive Director of USBC, and I will be your moderator today. And we'll um, start off here with just a little bit of logistics and introduction while we have uh, some folks still, still logging on. Um, as I said, this is the very first in a brand new webinar series, and it is, has been launched as part of our broader efforts under our strategic framework to engage stakeholders in a collective impact model. Um, it is funded with, with support from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we are really looking forward to this opportunity to build the capacity and continue to build the muscle of the breastfeeding field to apply um, collective impact and, and collaboration principles and tools to really maximize our impact for policy and practice change across the United States. We will have webinars every two months in the even numbered months. So of course it's October, month 10, um, and they'll be on the fourth Tuesday of the month from 2 to 3.30 Eastern time. So this, this is the first fourth Tuesday of October, and, and we will pick up again the fourth Tuesday of December and, and so on. The materials for, for the webinar are actually in a couple of different places, um, and they will continue to be both um, in our new Collective Impact online learning community, uh, which you may have joined in our website. We'll talk a little bit more about the learning community and, and the other tools and resources online at the end of today's session. And it also is available on the public web page linked below. So if you don't know what I'm talking about with the learning community, if you've never yet gotten into the USBC website, just go to this um, quick link here at the bottom and you'll be able to download the slides. Um, and then after the webinar, we'll also post the, the video recording uh, for any folks who were not able to, to make it at this day and time. Um, during today's session, as with all of our webinars, um, you will be in listen-only mode, um, but you can submit questions, written questions, at any time by typing them into the box on your webinar control panel. And I'll show you in just a moment what that looks like. Um, here you can see a, a screenshot of what the control panel uh, might look like. Um, sometimes it, after you've been on for a while, it will actually um, minimize itself. So you might just be seeing this little bit here. Um, if that happens, just click on that orange, orange and white arrow, and that will pop out the, the full view of it again. Um, and then once it's out, um, you can see there's a questions icon here. Um, if that is arrow is pointing to the right, just go ahead and click that little gray arrow and it will open the box um, where over here you can type your question. So again, you can do that at any point during the session. Uh, we will be monitoring those in case you're having any logistical problems during, during the presentation. Um, you can also chat us, chat us that way um, or um, if there's questions, we, we will um, look at those and, and do those at the end. If you're having any, any technical issues and the webinar control panel is, is not working so great, maybe you can hear us but you can't see us, um, you can also email us at this address, um, office at usbreastfeeding.org. Um, once again, that's office at usbreastfeeding.org. Um, that's another way to, to get technical assistance during, during the session. Um, so again, as I said, our topic today is thinking and acting differently, the collective impact opportunity. And I know many of you have probably heard us talk about um, collective impact over the last couple of years at USBC. Um, it has really become a, a significant part of how we are, are getting our work done at USBC and how we are really fulfilling our collaborative um, and collaboration purpose at USBC. 
Uh, collective impact in particular is a unique form of collaboration that has been demonstrating powerful results on complex community issues. Um, and on this first webinar, we are thrilled to have Sylvia Chu from Tamarack, who will talk about the five conditions and three preconditions of collective impact and tell us some stories of it in action. She'll also explore opportunities to use collective impact as a framework to advance lasting systems change that is beyond the scope of any one sector. And as we know, breastfeeding is, is an issue that is very complex and crosses multiple sectors. So definitely um, looking forward to, to hearing your feedback on, on that. Um, Amelia Pismais, the Deputy Director of the USBC, will also speak about how to approach collective impact principles to guide our policy change at a pace and scale that works for you, um, regardless of the stage of growth of your coalition. Um, so we'll, she'll talk a bit more um, at after Sylvia has presented. Um, and I'm going to show you next um, a little image of, of both of them. Uh, just a bit more about Sylvia, our, our guest presenter today. Sylvia leads the Deepening Community online learning team and provides coaching, leadership, and support in the fields of collaborative leadership, collective impact, and community engagement. She is an internationally recognized trainer and community builder, and she's the editor of Engage, uh, Tamarack's award-winning e-magazine, which um, if you're a subscriber to the USBC Weekly Wednesday Wire, you've probably seen um, our Collective Impact Connection, where we often share and cross-post articles from Engage. So thanks, Sylvia, for all the great, the great content that you, um, that you bring and that we were able, able to cross-post here at USBC. Um, Prior to joining Tamarack, Sylvia was director of Headwaters Communities in Action, a grassroots citizens group um, in the Ontario region, or Ontario's Headwaters region. And um, Sylvia recently completed her master's diploma in social innovation at the University of Waterloo, where she explored opportunities to create change within regional food systems. So um, without further ado, I'm going to give coach controls over to Sylvia here. Um, and as I said, Amelia Pismith will also um, be sharing after Sylvia. And I won't, won't give a lot of introduction of Amelia because I know many of you know her. Amelia has been the Deputy Director of USBC um, for, for the last several years. And before that, um, she was one of our uh, coalition leaders with the Breastfeeding Coalition of Oregon. Uh, so we can see your slide, Sylvia. Go ahead, take it away. Thanks so much, Megan. Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. I know we're crisscrossing time zones here. Um, thanks for the warm welcome. Listen, I am going to start with an assumption. <clears throat> um, so you've met me, um, but I'm going to start with an assumption that many of you um, probably are um, at a range of different sort of knowledge levels with respect to collective impact. That's certainly the experience that I find as I've been going out and meeting with groups and doing some introductory work around collective impact. So for that reason, I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of walk us through quickly, but you know, really kind of trying to cross uh, and accommodate uh, the interest and learning needs of you across perhaps a broad spectrum around collective impact. Um, for those of you, uh, some of you may have met my colleague Liz Weaver, who I understand has been doing some work with your. Um, with your group for some time now. But uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar, this is just a quick kind of snapshot and overview about the work that we do at Tamarack. So we really see our job as aligning knowledge and practice, and our aim is to build a connected force of leaders who are engaging in positive community change. Below are the core idea areas that we're really focusing on, and then we have two distinct practice areas where we're really trying to work in partnership with communities on experimenting with new solutions um, that integrate these five ideas. So Vibrant Communities is a real um, uh, city by city network of folks engaging multiple sectors on efforts to reduce poverty. And Deepening Community, which is the learning community that I'm more closely associated with, is really exploring the role of neighbors and the role of citizens in building healthy and vibrant communities. So um, this is um, uh, so. 
the story behind Collective Impact is that it really kind of roared to the fore in 2011 when John Kanya and Mark Kramer of FSG, Social Impact Consultants, published an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And they very clearly defined Collective Impact as a disciplined cross-sector approach to solving complex social and environmental issues on a large scale. Now apparently, they came upon the five conditions and three preconditions of collective impact, which I'm going to introduce to you in a minute, because they were given a research assignment by a number of funders who said, listen, we've been investing in um, initiatives for quite some time now, and we're really curious to see what the net impact of our collective investment has been. And um, as they dug in and looked across a broad array of um, projects, what they found were the majority of them were effective in making a difference for program participants that had been engaged. But with the exception of a handful of the initiatives that they looked at, very few were actually shifting systems and, and really having a significant impact on the issues. And it was those small, those few that really caught their eye and their curiosity. And so the three preconditions and the five conditions of collective impact really emerged out of them looking at these distinct um, impactful um, initiatives and saying what are the common patterns that are consistent across them, though their issue areas were quite diverse. My colleague Mark Kabaj, I really like how he's framed this. He said, you know, really, um, he likes to say we're standing on the threshold of collective impact 3.0. So he describes Collective Impact 1.0, and it sounds like you might, as a, as a network, you might certainly resonate with this. There were a lot of folks out there in the world, and I would say Tamarack was one as well with our Vibrant Communities work, who knew that the standard programmatic approach to addressing a complex issue wasn't going to be enough. And so we were in the dark, kind of stumbling, trying to piece together a more impactful solution to the issue that we cared about. But there were no roadmaps to follow. Collective in, uh, Impact 2.0, uh, my colleague sort of really cites as the moment that the first papers were published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review that really framed so beautifully and clearly, thanks to the work of FSG, the five conditions and three preconditions. When that paper was published, I think two very distinct things happened. One, people like yourselves and ourselves um, kind of went, oh, look at that. They're kind of giving voice to or a framework or an articulation to how we've intuitively been working. And wow, isn't it powerful to have that work and that approach validated? Um, and at the same time, I think, there was a core group of people who were now kind of come also joining a, joining a growing number of folks who were recognizing that programmatic approaches, though effective, weren't enough to really advance um, meaningful systems change. And so what you saw, and it's been phenomenal, was a worldwide uptake in interest in collective impact. In fact, um, we just held at the end of September a Collective Impact Summit in Vancouver that attracted 260 people with representatives from nine different countries around the world. So it has just gone viral. And <clears throat> now, uh, I think, and as my colleague suggests, Collective three, uh, Impact 3.0 is basically saying to all of us, remember, this is an evolving body of practice. As more and more people are working with these, this framework and experimenting with it on a broad array of issues, um, there is a real opportunity for all of us to contribute to this field of knowledge and really deepen the um, sort of ecology of practices, ca capabilities, skills, and resources. And so as you continue your own learning journey with Collective Impact, I think the field would welcome your contributions and insights because we are all kind of figuring this out as we go. I really like this picture. Um, I'm, I don't know how many of you would really relate to it, but certainly what Collective Impact is beyond the definition, you know, one of the challenges is it's about remembering, it's about having cons positive and consistent progress at scale. So, and being focused on the significant measurable impact around your issue. So in spite of a plan, which might look like the best plan on paper, almost always 
folks that are kind of embracing a collective impact approach start to unfold the plan and witness that the world around them is changing as the plan unfolds. And so the real art to this work is around knowing how to seize the right opportunities to keep always with the eye on the end goal around positive and consistent progress over time. I know one of the big questions that I often get asked when I go out and speak to groups about collective impact is, well, we've been doing this kind of work for a while. We've been collaborating like crazy. What's the difference between collaboration and collective impact? So before we dive into sort of reviewing the content of collective impact per se, I want to just take a couple minutes and anchor us in um, a bit of a frame around a whole spectrum of options around collaboration to begin to answer that big question. So how is collective impact a form of um, different from collaboration? And what I would say is that really, you'll see this red box here that I've just popped up on the screen. Collective impact really sort of sits in the realm of cooperation, collabor um, coordination, collaboration, and integration. That's kind of where it is on the whole spectrum. Now, if you look, um, you'll see there's a there's with the blue box and the purple box. There's some assumptions that are embedded in um, in that as you move along this continuum of collaboration. Um, the levels of trust required to work well as you move to the right of the continuum grow. So implicit then in embracing a collective impact approach is the need to really emphasize approaches and the necessary time to build trust across uh, a network of folks. And as well, commitment or a sense of turf will decline over time as a result. Okay. So collective impact is a form of collaboration. The other piece I would say um, is how it differs from more traditional forms of collaboration are two real key distinguishing features in my opinion. The first is that collaboration um, is almost, is very often a single sector phenomenon. So you'll see lots and lots of collaboration across sort of the healthcare field or you know, within the realm of community services. But collective impact is really saying we're bringing multiple sectors together. And in particular, puts an emphasis as well on ensuring that folks with lived experience of that issue, the context experts they're often referred to, are as uh, powerful a voice at the table as the content experts who um, may be knowledgeable from a particular field. The second sort of anchor I want to kind of give to us before we dive into collective impact is um, this sense of complexity. So the reality is, with all its popularity, um, you know, one of the things that I'm getting more and more convinced of and clear on is that collective impact, though it's wildly popular, isn't necessarily the solution to use in all contexts, right? So then the natural question that flows from there is, well, when does it make sense to use collective impact as opposed to another potential approach to addressing an issue? And for me, I would answer that question by saying, if the issue that you're working on is a complex one, then collective impact is probably a really useful framework to be working in. So then that creates the next question, which is, how do you know if the issue that you're working on is a complex one or not? So I'm not sure how many of you have seen this before. It comes from the work of Brenda Zimmerman. Um, and uh, so she'll talk about, in general, um, you can probably put an issue or a, a problem into one of three boxes. So the first, simple, sort of the analogy that she'll often use is making soup. So if I have a recipe for soup and Megan has a recipe for soup, we both follow the recipe to the letter, odds are Megan's soup and my soup, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. There is a proven recipe. The answer to how to do this is known. We just have to follow the recipe. You know, in the realm of public health, hand washing would be an excellent example of something that's simple, right? We know what it is. It doesn't vary person to person. We just have to get it done. So the second type of problem is what's often called a complicated problem. And in a complicated problem, you know, you've got a number of systems that maybe need to line up properly. Um, there's a number of steps. So it's a bit trickier, but it's certainly knowable. And that more, the more and more we do it, the better off we get at doing it. These situations are situations that, for example, would do well from bringing in outside experts to help us figure it out.
figure it out. So the example here was sending a rocket to the moon. So obviously you need a navigation system, you need a heating and cooling system, you need all these different systems to work well together, but assuming you figure them out, once you got them figured out, they're not going to shift and change too much. For me, another great example of this would be putting on a play. Right, so we have the script, you know, we know we need costumes, we know we need props, we know we need marketing, we know we need all the lighting and sound, these things. How it all gets figured out in the context of our play might vary from play to play, but we certainly have the formula going in, and we do have to just put it in play. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are parents, but the best analogy for a complex problem is raising a child. And you'll see from this picture, right, that when the issue is raising a child, part of the reason it becomes so complex is that the, you know, both the both the parent and the child are are evolving and changing. The environment around them is not static either. And so depending on all of these factors, things can change all the time. The other thing is if any of you have more than one child, I'm sure this won't come as a huge surprise to you, but just because you're really good um, at raising a particular child, the minute you add child number two to the mix, their personality may be completely distinct and different from their sibling, and therefore the parenting strategies that worked so brilliantly for you um, for your first child may not work so well for child number two, and so it's a bit of a learning journey. You can certainly kind of find uh, advice um, and ideas, but there's no guarantee that you're going to find one solution that will work in all contexts. So it's much more dynamic. And so it is those more dynamic uh, situations that collective impact is ideally suited for. So with that as a bit of a frame, let's jump right in now and I'll walk you quickly through an overview of collective impact. So initially, um, when uh, the first papers were published, three it, um, preconditions were identified, influential champions, urgency of the issue, and adequate resources. Um, now one of the things that's really interesting is when you talk about influential champions, sometimes it is really high profile people who will lend their name to your cause, but as importantly, you want their influence. Right? Not just sort of their profile, but who could they introduce you to? How do they bring your message into their network and validate the work you're doing? In terms of urgency of issue, you know, one of the things for someone like myself who's really passionate about an issue and thrown my energy behind it, I sometimes get shocked when I, I learn that other people aren't living and breathing my issue every day. So this is a really good, you know, this is reminding us that before we act, we really got to take some time to sort of sense how are others perceiving our issue. If we're not a high priority, you know, are there ways in which we can do some education in informing people to raise the profile of our issue um, and to whom? Because not everyone needs to hear that message. So, you know, in terms of scoping your work, who are the ones that you really need to make sure are aligned and on side and familiar with your, uh, your issue? And then finally, the adequate resources piece, I think for me, one of the big reminders is, yes, certainly, uh, to effectively lead a collective impact effort does require resource. I'm not um, being Pollyanna about that. But I do want to just say that it's not just about the money either. It's also about you know, who has what resources that they can contribute and share to the effort. So what you'll see here in a quick snapshot is the five conditions of collective impact. Okay, That's just a quick overview. And now what I'd like to do is just walk us through each one of them in more depth. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm kind of going faster than I was supposed to. So really, but at the end of the day, the five conditions of co collective impact, which I will unpack more in more depth in a moment, are really aimed. It's an approach that really aims to shift policy, to shift organizations and how programs are delivered, and ultimately hopes to impact and shift um, the out results in community. This set of five questions we find is uh, that come from the White House Council on Community Solutions, their Community Collaboratives Toolbox. It's a really nice sort of litmus test also useful to bring to boards and leadership groups. These five questions, um, you know, are we really committed to making significant and measurable progress on an issue? Do we believe that the kind of 
change we want to make happen requires an investment of more than three to five years to make that happen. Are we committed to working across sectors? using measurable data, and I think that is one of the big contributions that Collective Impact has brought to the field of collaboration, that emphasis on measurable data. And are we committed to having community members as partners and, and producers of the impact? In our experience, it's a good litmus test, both in terms of how one might strengthen your collaborative effort to more align with a collective impact approach, and also our experience that if, for example, you find yourself saying no, to two or, or two, uh, or you can say a no to three or more of these, then maybe a collect, full on collective impact uh, approach isn't something that you're ready for or is ideally suited for what you're trying to get done. So now let's take the five conditions and unpack them a bit. The first is the common agenda. So obviously, part of that is being very clear and explicit about the challenge that you are trying to address together across the various sectors. There's, but at the same time, it's also recognizing that um, you have a shared and agreed upon approach to how you're going to tackle that challenge. Um, very often, what we like to see in a, co in a common agenda statement is also the positive or aspirational goal that we are striving to together. So it is the what, the what we want to work on together, but it's also a, the beginning of the articulation of how we intend to get there, how we intend to work together to make it happen. So let me give you a concrete example. This comes from a case study that FSG has written up about Somerville, which is a racially diverse, socioeconomic, uh, and socioeconomically and racially diverse community um, in Massachusetts. Um, and so they, as a community, really rallied around this notion of childhood obesity and recognized that only by working and bringing together folks from different sectors would they have a high impact. So they knew their data, right? They started with a recognition that said 46% of the youth in their community were overweight or obese. They also acknowledged in sort of building their case that the past in interventions that they had sort of tried that were programmatic in nature and focused on individual behavior change hadn't been as promising and, and effective as they had hoped. And therefore, they were reaching out and looking for a new approach that combined both individual behaviors but also a much more community-wide approach to how they would tackle the problem. And so what they did was they really ultimately um, worked towards creating a culture of obesity prevention. Now, if you look, it's beautiful, right? They've distilled their common agenda down to three very concrete and specific sets of activities. Something around increasing daily physical activity, really focusing on healthy eating, and then also from a policy and infrastructure lens, creating cities, communities that made these healthy choices easier for everyone to do. And you'll see as well as their initiative has evolved, right? They started as a three-year research project and today have grown to having a 30-member steering committee uh, with uh, a range of three positions in their backbone role and that they've actually reached across multiple sectors to achieve their effort. The second, um, um, the second condition of collective impact is shared measurement. So this is good. So shared measurement really says we have to figure out what are the measures across the sectors that we all agree on. What's the data that we're going to track that enable us to know that we're making positive progress over time? But as importantly as agreeing upon the data, it's also about making sure that we've put in place as part of the design of our initiative systems that we are agreed we're all going to use to both gather and analyze this data periodically and then pull us together um, periodically to make sense of what is this data telling us. We've been experimenting, trying X, Y, and Z. You know, now we're looking at data six months in. What kind of a change are we having? Is it the kind of change we were hoping? And if not, what do we need to tweak or change to help get ourselves on track? So here's a great example. Comes from a community not far from where I live uh, in, in Halton region in Ontario. Um, it's interesting because it's two urban uh, communities and three rural, all kind of within one regional government. 
So they, as a broad community of multiple uh, sectors, got together and aligned around a common agenda about every child thriving. So then they took, uh, they moved back a step and they said from a shared measurement point of view, they would know that all children were thriving if these seven things listed as the Halton Seven were happening. And then they backed up further from there and identified particular data sets that they were going to track over time to ensure that they were making progress against the Halton Seven. And then they began to map and demonstrate across multiple sectors the whole range of programs and services that cumulatively were being offered across the community in support of that overarching common agenda. And then as they've matured, because they've been at this for uh, 10 years now, I think, um, 10 or 12, they've now sort of moved from uh, annual printed reports to an online data portal, which is an interactive online database that can be used by multiple providers and enables them at any point in time to pull up data around that's geographically based. And here's an example of about grade three um, school performance based on their whole uh, catchment area. And you can see where kids are doing better, where other kids may be struggling, and, and start to map all of those things out. The third uh, condition of collective impact is mutually reinforcing activities. So this is really important. Oftentimes, you know, a lot of the low-hanging fruit or early wins you see in a collective impact effort come from just bringing partners who don't normally work together around the same table, getting them to learn about each other's work and opportunities by just lining up what they've done already um, in new and better ways, there's better kind of flow through the system and greater impact is, is, is possible. Um, one of the key lessons, however, in terms of really working well and def uh, across multiple partners to get to that mutually reinforcing activities place is to start from the lens of the community. And it may seem pretty obvious when you hear it here, but you know, many of us, if you've been working with an organization for any length of time, it's easy by default when asked to introduce yourself and your organization to speak about um, your mission, your mandate, your objectives as an organization. What the challenge here and the reminder of this slide is to say that what we need to do instead, slightly different frame, is talk about the aspiration we have for the community overall and what it is we're trying to change and then ask each organizational player at the table to speak about the kinds of contributions that they, them, their organization and their or, um, representatives make in the achieving of the community-wide aspirational vision. When you frame it that way, what happens is it be you know it helps to diffuse some of the natural fear that many organizational folks have in entering into a collaborative exercise around um, you know that this is a competition because it, it it frames it more in each one of us is acting in service of a broader um, community aspiration and part of the work we have to do together is begin to define where those you know where we have resources at play and where there might be some gaps and opportunities. So again, to make this more concrete, we're bringing you back to the story of Shape Up Somerville, and you'll really see here how they really recognize to make that sort of culture of um, obesity reduction a reality was they went right across the spectrum. So they were looking at, you know, what can they do before school for young people? What are, what's happening during school? What's happening after school? You know, what kinds of resources are needed at home, and what kinds of resources are needed in the community, and how do we make sure that they all know about each other so that that message is perpetually reinforcing. Continuous communication is the fourth of the five conditions of collective impact, and what it's telling us is that it's, this is very, very relational work. So it's important that we have both formal and, and informal channels to, for keeping people informed about the progress of a collective impact effort, you know, experimenting with different styles. It's also recognizing that there are probably three core audiences, right? There is the communication that's needed across the organizations that are participating in the collective impact effort. There are also communication needs within each one of the partner organizations that have people involved in the effort. And then um, typically there are also communications needed to the
community as a whole in terms of progress and how things are going and what we're learning. The final um, condition of collective impact, the backbone infrastructure, it's interesting how we've watched this term evolve as collective impact has really kind of caught fire. Initially, it was talked about as the backbone organization. But in fact, it doesn't have to be a single organization who holds this role. It's just a recognition that because we're working across sectors and across organizations, we can't assume that infrastructure needed to support this work exists. We have to be very, very intentional about creating a support infrastructure for this. And those uh, six bullets to the side talk about the core roles of the, the backbone. So let me give you a concrete example, again, to try and anchor this and make this a bit more real and tangible. So this is a story about a collective impact effort in Erie, Pennsylvania. So around 2008, with the economic downturn, the mayor of Erie, uh, together with his uh, county cohort, woke up to some startling news that they, in fact, had the highest poverty levels of anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania, which was not a claim to fame that they were pleased with, and they immediately put their heads together to try and figure out what to do instead. The outcome, after much research and looking at promising practices from different jurisdictions, was to form this initiative called Erie Together. So they were really clear in terms of a common agenda. Here is what they said. They you know, really built some desired outcomes around learning so that all more children in Erie would become successful adults. From a work perspective, they were interested in Erie residents having family sustaining employment and thriving that more Erie County families had, could meet their basic needs. So that's great, but here's the piece I really love. When they went out to communicate to the world at large the formation of what Erie Together was, they actually spoke about what it wasn't. So they said, look, this is not a social service agency. It's not a program. It's a county-wide civic movement. So what's beautiful about framing it in this way is it then creates an open invitation to anyone and everyone in the community to contribute their resources, gifts, talent, knowledge to get behind what the desired outcomes were of Erie Together. So fairly quickly, they formed three county-wide action teams around each of the, the outcomes. And these different teams periodically met individually, but they also met um, together and tried to figure out where on earth would they start, okay? Knowing, so around the learn table, what they got, they really kind of unpacked these four sort of steps that would result in the overarching goal that more children become successful adults. So they wanted, you know, that ready to learn when they enter kindergarten was one big marker. Another was reading, reading levels in third grade. You know, another was what kinds of supports were available for youth as they were planning for their own futures, and then really also monitoring high school graduation rates. Frankly, each and every one of these would have been a perfect entry point to design a whole initiative around, and that would fit quite nicely under this initiative. This um, goal. The challenge was the debate about went on and on about where should they start. And the people in this work group were a little confused and unsure about where to start. And then, as um, so you can see, right, they started playing around. They were looking for what's the big leverage point? You know, should we look at increasing STEM? Should we look at um, increasing graduation rates. You know, we, they knew from data that teen pregnancy was a bit of an issue. Is that where they should put most of their emphasis? They just weren't sure. And then at a particular meeting that they went to, um, someone came in at, with the shocking news that, in fact, um, the corporate prison system used third grade reading scores as the best predictor for how many prisons they ought to be building a decade from now. When they heard that, I don't even know if it's true, but it was a galvanizing moment for that committee in terms of choosing their third grade reading as the one thing that they wanted to begin by focusing on. And it's really powerful because what it shows you is when they did focus on that, they knew that there was a whole body of literature available around what's needed to enhance third grade reading scores. It did take some homework to go and figure out where they were at as their baseline and starting point, and this is where they were at on the far left. 
So 34% of their kids were reading, 33 were reading below the basic level at grade 3, 34 were reading uh, at the basic level, and 34 were in the uh, proficient and advanced realm. But with this focused effort led by this multi-sectoral committee that engaged uh, faith communities, grandparents in reading clubs, libraries, you name it, with a proven and consistent approach, within three years, look what they had done. They had shifted. So only 6% of the kids in the, in the county were reading below basic, 19% were at the basic level, and a full 75% of the kids were reading uh, uh, above, uh, proficient or advanced by third grade. So this is one of the paradoxes of this work, right? On the one hand, if you go back to the previous slide, any one of these entry points could have been a promising and effective entry point. But it is important in the scope of knowing that wholeness to actually land on something. And frankly, on another level, you know, the power of getting going and having a clear measurable focus really helped them achieve powerful results, which then kind of was like a flame to keep, uh, keep going on that and then begin to take on other pieces as well. So the final piece that I really want to touch on with you in the time that I have left is to really emphasize that while you've just heard an overview of the five conditions and three preconditions, um, you know, even John Kanye himself last year when he was at our Collective Impact Summit in Toronto said he was beginning to reach a, a realization that the three preconditions and five conditions of collective impact are necessary but not sufficient to really, if we're really, really serious about systems change. And so what I'm going to do now is just quickly unpack for you some of the implicit um, mindset shifts that embracing a collective impact approach kind of invites so that you're aware. So please, it, you know, it is, some, it, it is a choice around choosing a different way. Um, and it really, really, really involves these five things. So you are planning and doing at the same time. And as defined as your plan is, you always need to leave space for a new possibility to emerge and be acted on. That the relationships between players and between systems are as important as the whatever the work is. That not only do we have to let data help us decide our entry points when we're stuck, we also need, as we watch for our data, to not be so razor focused on the measures that we thought that we miss or we, we lose um, capturing important lessons and insights from unanticipated results. And <laughs> I love this, this attitude of burning patience. So paradoxically, you're wanting to move fast and the, there's an urgency around your issue and sometimes you need to stand still to bring everyone on side and to go deep enough to know that this is the right pathway. You know. So, you know, three big mindset shifts are implicit in this. One, we have to really challenge our historical sort of defaults around who we involve. Two, how people work together. And three, how progress happens. So, really, you know, one of the things we really need to be asking ourselves, not only is who do we have at the table, but also the who's missing. And really what you're looking for, because you're looking for new approaches, are the people who, A, have lived experience of the system, or people whose voices aren't normally heard within the system or around the issue. Um, I was recently um, doing some work out in Calgary with the Homelessness Foundation, and I loved that the, uh, the, the, the new CEO was getting lots of pressure from um, her significant funders to say, we want certainty. We want certainty. Can you, we've invested in all of this approach. We want you to be assure us that this investment is going to pay off like you said it will. And she ended up saying, listen, you want certainty. Um, my recommendation is we go back to doing things the way we did them before, because then you and I will both be certain that it's not going to work. She said, remember, this work is about really moving into the territory of the uncertain. So we do need to have perspectives that will shake us up and move us out of our own comfort zones and our own biases around who and what we think is needed to make change happen. Um, the second mindset shift really is 
finding new partners. A lot of this, the innovation and opportunity comes from bringing different people who don't typically work together to think together on the same issue. So creating that common intent, really making sure that content expertise and the local context lived experience expertise are balanced, and making sure that we spend that time, that we slow down, as I said before. Um, we just um, were really impressed by a recent presentation by Karen Pittman from the Forum for Youth Investment out of Washington, D.C., who really talks about the importance of bringing people together to collectively see, collectively learn, and collectively frame what the issue is that they want to work on together as a precursor to diving into collective impact, and I think that's pretty wise. And then I think the third mindset shift to really kind of pay attention to is thinking about how progress happens. So many of us are very familiar with program strategies, and in fact, most funders tend to found, fund along programmatic lines. But this, you know, our problem is, historically, we keep investing in programs and then being frustrated that they don't change systems. And so this is just a reminder that if we really want system change to happen as part of this work, then we have to be intentional about designing system strategies into the work of the collective impact effort. So how do you do that? Here are some here are five different or four different things to pay attention to. So you want to be really looking at how you increase coordination across the system between programs and stakeholders. You want to look for opportunities to enhance how existing services are delivered, either by realigning them and or expanding them in key ways. You want to make sure that while you're doing all the programmatic stuff, you're also thinking about the policy environment and what changes need to be made there so that as um, as uh, my friend Alan Mansky will say, your new idea just becomes part of the water supply. And then finally, there's a real recognition that this work is often done through prototyping. So you do little experiments. It might be in one neighborhood. It might be in one jurisdiction. You learn from that, and you talk, think about how you can grow that uh, promising practice in new ways and sort of spread it out across a broader region. So at the end of the day, this is very much about also thinking about how do we engage our communities and build citizen leadership ownership in this work equally to that of service providers. So here's some really good tips on how we build the capacity of the community to help own this work alongside us and ultimately recognizing that this work is very much about leadership coming from multiple players with multiple perspectives. And these are 10 steps to really anchor adaptive leadership. So I'm just going to, um, whoops, I jumped over. Um, so in summary, collective impact, I would say use it when you're looking uh, to work collaboratively on complex issues. You want to bring in leadership from different sectors including lived experience leadership so that you understand the issue in a more holistic way. You really want to invest your time, I'm sorry, in building that commitment to a common agenda. Having it be aspirational is important. You want to be clear and agreed around how you are going to measure change towards achieving your common agenda so that if you're off track, you know, and you also know what's working. And that in, in addition to focusing on short-term shifts, you really need to look at those system and policy barriers and what changes are needed around that. And then there's a video here um, where uh, my colleague Liz Weaver unpacks each one of these five if you want to go deeper. So there you go. All done. And I'm just, I believe we move from here to questions. Is that right, Megan? Amelia? Yes. Um, I am just... Flipping over to Amelia, um, and she's going to speak a little bit about um, how we have begun to think about collective impact for our, our state breastfeeding coalitions in particular. Um, and Amelia, we should um, be able to see your slides if you go ahead and share your screen. We can see you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Fabulous. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Sylvia. That was a really lovely overview 
of collective impact. I think you did a nice job in presenting what can be lots of new terms and lots of new concepts in a way that's approachable and also shows us um, that we really want to make sure we're taking these principles and then applying them in the right circumstances and in the right times. And that's really what I wanted to um, center, center on today also. Um, there have been several webinars that USBC has uh, run um, in the recent past telling about our exploration of collective impact over the last several years and the resulting strategic framework that we built and the equity focus and the constellation model that we are launching, all to provide ba uh, backbone infrastructure support to the broader field, including our online website communities. And I encourage you to look at that if you're not familiar with them already. But today I really want to build on Sylvia's excellent introduction of these collective impact principles and help you begin to think about how and why you might want to apply these concepts to your state. So when we really encourage you to approach this at a pace and a scale that works for your organization. It is not necessary to do what USBC has done with fundamentally applying this and changing the organization from the inside out, hiring consultancy help and going all in. That was appropriate for us and we were ready for that. But you don't have to do that. You really can, as Sylvia said, pick and choose the right moments and opportunities to apply it. And we believe that even minor shifts in perspective and using the right tools at the right time can make a very big difference. We encourage you to build this to suit using min specs as the guide. So min specs is the minimum specification. So the lightest weight of governance or agreements that are needed in order to be able to be functional, but not to be bogged down in a top-heavy structure um, that is going to make things go more slowly. So we want to just understand um, when and why to apply these principles for lasting systems change and then really make it work for you. So to apply this a little bit, let's think of an example of a breastfeeding policy change that you've been involved with or have known about that came about sometime in the last five years. So that could be national, state, or local. So think of a concrete example, even write it down if you need to. So here we see that author Sharon Stachowiak has outlined six common theories on the pathways for social change. And this summarizes some of the underlying assumptions on typical activities and outcomes on how we make changes happen. So let's look at this together for a moment. One pathway is the large leap pathway. This happens when there's been significant changes um, that w when the right contextual conditions are in place and something really big can happen and often suddenly. The next pathway is the coalition approach, where you have a coordinated activity among a range of stakeholders that have the same core policy belief. Another pathway is where there's a policy window, where you effectively define the problem and the solution, and you take advantage of the contextual factors that encourage taking action. Another pathway is messaging and frameworks. We frame issues and policy options in a way that reflects the worldview or the preferences of decision makers. Another pathway is, the, is power politics or the power elite. This is where you're developing relationships with power brokers and people in a, in a position to make big changes and you work with them for, and leverage their power and influence. And finally, the grassroots community organizing pathway to change. So, this is where those that are directly affected by an issue work together, including pressuring the decision makers. Now, it's important to know that these are not limited. You don't have just only one channel or one pathway in any particular policy change. There can be some overlap. Let's look at some examples. So a great example of a large leap change was the Affordable Care Act. Right, there were, although it was contentious and although it remains contentious, there were uh, the right conditions to make an attempt and to implement significant changes all at once and move things forward. 
A great example of a coalition change is what's happening in our country around paid family leave. So we're seeing this is coordinated activities between cities and then some states, and now huge national movement and groundswell to really move the needle on this. The, the National Partnership for Women and Families and Moms Rising are both organizations that are very involved in a coalition approach to changing paid family leave in the United States. When we think about the pathway of policy windows, um, of course, the Surgeon General's Call to Action is a great example of this. It was a national framework that really helped to define the problem and a set of 20 different solutions that one could pursue in order to change the landscape for breastfeeding. A nice specific example of a policy window is the FAM Act. That is legislation that's looking at airport accommodations. And this was in response to an opportunity. So right now there's airport improvement program funds and a known solution of what would it look like to have accommodations for breastfeeding mothers when they're traveling. But also in a great example of how we're not limited to just one pathway in order to make a particular policy change, we, this also tapped into the pathway of the power elites. We had a champion in Tammy Duckworth who herself has a young infant and was traveling back and forth to DC and was encountering the lack of accommodations that really spurred her on to introduce this legislation. So an example of messaging and framework policy change is the breastfeeding cost analyses. So when Melissa Bartik um, showed us the cost of suboptimal breastfeeding, it gave us a new frame and a new way to, to talk about the issues, not just in terms of health impact, but in terms of financial impact. Another great example of this recently, North Carolina did a very innovative cost analysis to make the case to, for Medicaid coverage of lactation services. It's really just Switching the frame gave them a new power and leverage point to be able to go after the change that they wanted. A good example of power politics and power elites is the federal break time provision of the Affordable Care Act. Although workplace accommodations had been growing across the country from grassroots um, activities across many different states, ultimately there was a champion in the right place at the right time who said the right things to the right people and um, before anyone even knew what had happened, the federal break time provision had passed. Another good example of this is federal appropriations. We've had funding for breastfeeding in our country for several years now, again, very much because We've had champions in the right place who really understood the issue and pushed for um, significant funding to support breastfeeding. And certainly not least, the grassroots community organizing example um, is breastfeeding in public. So there's many state examples and we can see, as there should be, a groundswell across our country. So, there are both national and state examples of roadmaps for change. So the Surgeon General's Call to Action shows us focuses of support in six different areas and 20 different actions and shows that you, know, you can take many different pathways, um, but we need to be very clear about where we're going because we've defined the problem. Similarly, here's an example from Illinois of the Illinois Breastfeeding Blueprint plan for change. Similarly, it helps everybody have that common agenda that Sylvia spoke about and be working towards a common goal. So collectively, we know that we need to grow a movement from individual advocates and community organizations working at the local level, like our grassroots, then to advocacy and state level coalitions for policy and systems change. Those are like the branches and then to spread implementation of policy and systems change through federal and national initiatives, like the, the treetops. And what this really means is that we've seen how so much of our success already is built on different pathways, right? We've been able to get as far as we have with our policy change by implementing and using one or more of the pathways for policy change. But we need to have everyone engaged at every level and all of the parts to be aligned in order to go really have a movement from grassroots to treetops to build a breastfeeding movement that has maximum impact. 
So I'm now going to walk through the USBC spheres of influence. This is a model that we've developed in the last uh, year that we've been using to think about how USBC is positioned to serve as a backbone for the field and to describe how we engage in cross-sector collaboration. So this outer sphere in yellow is the mothers and babies sphere. And so this includes um, individuals like the fa fathers and partners, family members and friends, child care providers, individual advocates in her community, um, community health workers that might have, may have contact with her, clinicians and other health professionals, and also her coworkers. In the green sphere, this is the direct services and support sphere, where we have entities like doctor's offices and hospitals and the healthcare systems around that mother and, and baby, milk banks and local support groups and baby cafes, child care sites and work sites. The next level to this model is a, a multi-organization and cross-sector policy and change policy and practice change realm. So as you'll see, this is where the members of USBC and the partners of USBC, where we've mapped them out, but also where we have our federal government, state and local government, employer and business organizations and foundations, breastfeeding advocacy and support organizations, and also you can see the coalitions are here, the state, territorial, local, and tribal breastfeeding coalitions also civic and faith organizations. So these are the entities that are really poised to do cross-sector policy and practice change using the pathways that we talked about a moment ago. So we, here's how we are envisioning USBC and the backbone supports, including our committees and our staff, our board of directors, and the constellation stewards. So the constellations, are our action teams. And you'll notice that the constellations, our, our focused action teams, are really centered at this periphery between the blue and green spheres, the, the cross-sector policy and change agents, and the direct services and support. USBC does not have very much direct contact with individuals, although we're certainly um, building our website and our communications to reach out to the grassroots. We have less direct contact with individuals when we're thinking about the constellation and action teams that we're building to impact national policy and systems change. So taken all together, it's a little bit busy, that's why we wanted to show it to you, you know, in layers and in pieces. But this is our uh, vision right now for um, how we go about affecting national level policy systems and environmental changes. On this map, there have been some shifts where we're putting, this is the beginning of envisioning the state, territorial, local, and tribal coalitions at the center and what policy systems and environmental change might look like for a coalition. So you'll see some changes where within the pink sphere, we see your committees, um, if your, your coalition has staff or contractors, maybe your leadership team, and whatever your action teams may be called. Um, but notice that we recognize that for a state and local coalition, the boundary line for your action teams is more likely to include um, players and stakeholders from this yellow realm, from the individual realm where we see moms and babies and those who are directly impacting them. But it is also really critical for true cross-sector change that you're incorporating stakeholders from direct services and support realm and also from the cross-sector realm. Let's take a look at some of those in the blue spheres that we hope coalitions are really thinking strategically about including as you grow towards this policy systems and environmental change. It's entities like your state public health organizations, the state chapters of health professional organizations, the state chapters of business and employer organizations, it's local coalitions and cultural coalitions and local governments and state governments. 
So we really invite you to think about who is currently involved in your coalition and what would it look like to grow and who, who is missing and who would you want to reach out to to really think about building a collective impact response to pursue any one or more of the pathways for, cha for policy change in order to get where you need to go um, in your community. So this is uh, the beginning of a new series for us. On the next Collective Impact webinar, we're going to identify the cross-sector stakeholders that influence policy and practice change, really focused on state-level partners. So we're going to take that last uh, graphic that I showed you and talk more about um, who could be at the table and what the value would be of bringing them in. We're also going to introduce you to a tool called the Top 100 Partners. And in preparation for this, we are looking for a state breastfeeding coalition that would like to, serve, to volunteer to serve as an example. So this would mean working with us in the interim to do the Top 100 Partners exercise and help inform the slide and presentation that we give for the next webinar in this series. So feel free to um, be, be in touch with us if this seems like something that would be a good match for your coalition. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Megan. Great. Thank you, Amelia. And thank you also, Sylvia. This has been great. Um, we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes left to do some, some Q&A. Um, I also do have a little bit more that I want to tell you about the new Collective Impact Learning Community. Um, but, but first, I would invite folks to ask any questions that they might have for either Sylvia or Amelia, um, again, by typing into the questions box on your control panel. And I will put back up the... Um, slide that shows how to do that in just a second. I lost my uh, lost my spot. Okay. Um, you should see in just a moment. Um, let me flip back up. Um, again, you, this is what the, the webinar questions box looks like, and you can um, type any questions that you have. Uh, so we'll wait just a second, maybe while people are thinking about that, I will uh, flip back over and say a little bit more about the, um, the learning community um, and the, the discussion questions that we have for this first month might actually inspire some, um, some thoughts or, or comments from our, our audience as well. Um, so you may um, have already experienced, but for those who, who have not, um, the new USBC website that launched this spring um, houses more than 20 different online learning communities, um, including there's one on um, each of the topics, the 20 actions of the Surgeon General's call to action. Um, there is also, um, there are also communities on um, other functional areas, such as advocacy media, um, our, our equity work, and of course, this collective impact um, community. And these are open, as Amelia said, one of the things that we have been able to do with the new website is really open up to any interested individuals out there, um, whether you are representing an organization or just um, an interested, interested individual um, person in, in the world of breastfeeding. And so you can explore these. You can, um, you can check them out and look at them, um, even if you don't join them. But for the topics that you do find that you might be interested in, you can click a little button to, to join them. And then you can also choose to either subscribe to receive email, or you can just view the community only in the website. So the, the link here at the bottom is the link to see the full list of um, all of the communities. I'll click on that really quickly so that you can see um, the links to all of them. And then in particular at the bottom, um, you can see here there's the Collective Impact Learning Community. Um, and I've, I've already joined it, so you, but you can see if I were to, to leave, um, what, what you would just do is um, click on the, uh, that button would become a join button. So we'll 
go back and see what it would be like to come in and you can click this join button it will pop you right in and then you can see here there's also the subscribe buttons for the different um, tools within it um, so that is is how you get to it um, just to say a little bit more about the collective impact one um, the intention here as, as we said this is the very first launch of it but our intention is to host this as an ongoing community and really to be an inclusive learning process open to anyone in the field um, of breastfeeding of course you know we do have a, a particular focus um, oftentimes on the, the state breastfeeding coalitions um, but certainly we believe that the content will be relevant to to any focus interested in collective impact and, and collaboration tools and principles uh, related to breastfeeding. We will have, um, just like with the equity community, we'll have a bi-monthly theme. So this um, community will, will meet at the end of the even-numbered months. So towards the beginning of, of those months, we will post the, the theme with a microblog and, and some discussion questions to stimulate conversation amongst those in the online community. There will be a moderated discussion forum there, uh, which I'll show you in just a moment, where you can um, take a look at those questions, share your experiences, share your questions, um, and it also interact with each other. There will be a file library where uh, we'll have um, selected readings, recommended readings from USBC, um, including, of course, the, the original articles that uh, came out um, with the concepts of collective impact in the last few years. So we'll, we'll give you some early beginner readings if, if you are new, um, as well as some um, more advanced um, readings for those who have, might have been exploring collective impact for a while. Um, as well as readings related to the theme. So when we have our, our monthly theme, we might also share a particular um, blog post or article um, or a, you know, a tool and a chapter about how to use a tool, those types of things, depending on what the topic is that month. Um, and then, of course, we'll close out each of those even-numbered months with the webinar. Um, and See, we do have a couple of questions, um, but in the meantime, I'll, sh I'll also show you, these might stimulate some other comments or questions um, for, for those on the call. Um, the discussion questions, of course, because today is our launch, we didn't, we didn't have discussion leading up to today's webinar, but we did want to begin some conversation coming out of the webinar this time and have, have posed a few questions um, for you. Starting off with, you know, first of all, what, what questions do you have about um, applying these principles, um, all of the great concepts? That, that Sylvia talked about as well as Amelia. What, what questions do you have? What do you want to learn more about um, as you're hearing this? What has intrigued you or piqued your interest? And, and really you're thinking about how, how do I apply this to my organization? Um, another question based on what you've heard today um, related to Amelia's sharing of the what we call the influence spheres. Um, you know, do you think or see that your coalition might be lighter or heavier on, on any one of those spheres? Um, you know, for example, at USBC, um, we are especially light on the yellow sphere. As Amelia said, that, that yellow sphere represents the individuals, um, whereas the green sphere represents the entities or the institutions um, where, where they might um, be working and, and interacting. And so we don't have a lot of, of um, engagement with people who are, who are individuals at USBC. We typically had an organizational structure. Um, so you might you might be like that, or you might be might be different. Um, so may, maybe something to think about. And if if you have any comments on that uh, now, please go ahead and, and share them in in the chat box as well. Um, a related question, um, and I know some coalitions have done this because we've asked about it on the coalition needs assessment. But has your coalition done um, any sort of a recent analysis of who is at your table? Um, and if so, what what did you learn? Um, that's another great great thing to, to think or talk about. Um, and then the lastly, has your coalition um, reached out to a new partner or maybe a non-traditional partner that hadn't previously been, been somebody you'd thought about um, at your table? And, and if, if you did, how did that go? Um, so just a, a few things to stimulate. And again, you can share on the chat box here, and then you can also share um, on the website if you'd like to later into the community. Um, so I see we have a few questions coming in here. Um, let's see. We have a couple questions about uh, the slides and the speak 
Gur notes. Um, yes, yeah, so the slides are are posted um, already in in a couple of a couple of places. Um, I'll flip back over to the online community here and just show you. Um, first of all, the uh, discussion questions that I just posed are already posted here. So if you're interested and you'd like to respond, um, you can come over and and click right on one of these, and um, and very easily hit. Um, reply to, to the question. Um, you can also find the, the webinar slides and click back over to the main community page. You can see the webinar slides in a couple of spots. One is down here in the file library for the webinars and discussions. There, they reside in here. Um, and then the other place, if you're coming in and you have not yet joined a community and or gotten a login yet, under the About Us section, there is this page here called Collective Impact. And this one is just a public facing, public facing page. And you can find all the information about this webinar, uh, the slides. Um, Sylvia also has a, a handout um, for us and um, information about the webinar. And of course, future webinars will also um, be, be loaded there. So that's um, the quick place. And then again, there's a link to get you into the community for, for more discussion or engagement. Um, let's see, we have another questioner about, um, can we provide some examples of non-traditional partners being engaged? Um, there's, so there's two questions. I'll, I'll ask that one first and see if Amelia or, or Sylvia have some, some thoughts, some examples of non-traditional partners. Yeah, this is Amelia. So um, one example, as we're, as we're shifting to a model, where we can um, have more portability and how stakeholders can come in to the uh, conversations and the activities that have meaning for them, but don't have to sign on to everything that is less applicable. Um, a good example would be inviting the US Department of Labor to come and interface with the workplace constellation, specifically about workplace um, uh, regards and how things are going with rolling out um, the federal law and what kind of support we could have with them. Um, so in this model, they were able to, they've been able to come to our meetings and continue to have conversations with the stakeholders that are concerned in that topic, but they don't have to stay for, you know, healthcare conversations or other kinds of conversations that are not going to be of their concern. Um, on the community level, um, maybe it would look like uh, inviting a school partner to come to a coalition meeting. I could see a couple different opportunities to then expand the conversation, both to um, workplace accommodations within the school setting, um, and also um, an example of um, could there be breastfeeding education woven into the content that students are engaging in throughout you know, their, their lives as students um, to normalize breastfeeding as part of you know, a lifetime of experience and just part of growing. Those two, off the top of my head, those are two examples. Hi, Megan, and this is Sylvia here. So not specifically a breastfeeding example, but I know from a colleague's work with um, within the realm of poverty reduction, you know, having people with the lived experience of poverty at the table as solutions are being generated is often critical because it helps to both identify opportunities that if you weren't poor you wouldn't even recognize and or to, you know, validate and give important feedback in shaping the kinds of solutions that would work. But as you can imagine, you know, a colleague of ours was, was building a round table with a deep commitment to engaging folks with, who are living in poverty at, meaningfully at the table in this multi-sector effort and in spite of removing a lot of the obvious barriers, you know, so making sure that the transportation costs were covered, providing childcare, providing an honorarium, all of the obvious sort of ways to make it easy for folks with lived experience to participate, you know, what they were finding was folks would come for one or two meetings and then they wouldn't stay. 
And this was deeply troubling to the leadership core group. So they stepped back and started having conversations, and what they discovered uh, surprised them quite a bit. So, you know, one, uh, one or two of the folks with lived experience said, listen, you know, I sit around this table, and each and every one of you comes representing your organization or your constituency, and I'm sitting as a single individual living in poverty, and i got to tell you, you know, I'm a single mom. I have three kids. My experience of poverty is completely different from my neighbor's because he's an, a new immigrant and he's a senior citizen. And so I feel um, I feel it's not authentic for me to speak about about the experience of poverty because all I have is my own experience of poverty. And I'm not speaking on behalf of a constituency in the same way that the rest of you are. But that was actually a really powerful learning moment for the leadership group. So what they did was they actually created a, a drop-in coffee coffee network that would meet weekly. Where so folks with lived experience would come and be part of that coffee crew, and they watched who the natural leaders are that kind of emerged from that group and invited them to be spokespersons on behalf of that coffee group, which had a diversity of people with lived experience of poverty at the table. And they, w they did get some folks to say yes, and those people they could retain because if ever there was an issue that came to the table, they, like the other sort of leaders at the table, had a constituency that they could go back and engage if they themselves didn't know the answer. And ultimately, that was really a critical piece in bringing those, uh, not just bringing, but keeping those unusual partners at the table. Mm. Yeah, great example. Um, this is Megan. I, I might share a couple, a couple of others that came to mind um, for, for me, just thinking about um, areas where I've heard of particularly unique um, state coalition experiences. One is, um, of course, Indiana's partnership with, with Walgreens. Um, there's there's been a lot of um, unique ideas, both both in breastfeeding and then also in, in the broader food movement. I'm sure some of you have have seen and heard of the. Um, you know, how they're bringing fresh fruits and vegetables into um, Walgreens and CBS and some of these, you know, where there's drugstores in, in many more places sometimes than there are um, grocery stores. And similarly, in Indiana, they um, set up breastfeeding support in lo a local Walgreens um, in, as, a, as a new initiative. So that, that could be one, you know, looking at just traditional or non-traditional community partners, locations where um, moms might be able to, to reach more, more easily. Um, another one that we've been thinking about both as a, as a national um, outreach as well as um, state and community is, is the YMCA. Um, so, you know, if, if that's something that, that you have experience with your local YMCA or YWCA, um, looking at breastfeeding programming, that, that's a great example we want to hear from because um, we're, we're getting ready to reach out to the, the national folks there. Um, I, know, I know there have been, been some um, breastfeeding um, programs there. Um, another one that has been really hot for us the last couple of years is, is faith communities, faith organizations. Um, you know, not something that we had traditionally focused on at, at USBC, um, but you may have seen this this summer the, the launch of the um, Health Minister's Guide to Breastfeeding, where, where we worked with the HHS uh, Center on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships to launch a, an outreach guide to, to really bring congregational leaders um, along into thinking about breastfeeding and how they can support in their congregations. So that could be another tool for you um, to think about. And then you know, a last one, I, I just want to also put in a plug for the Weekly Wednesday Wire, because we do share a lot of huge variety of different items in there. Um, Danae and I were just talking this morning, uh, and she works with the coalitions. Many of you know, know Danae, our coalitions coordinator, and we were thinking about, you know, how can we begin to put some of these ideas in, in front of you? Um, but in particular, we had a, an item last week that we shared in the Weekly Wire. There was a report from uh, about TANF, um, which is the, the U.S. Welfare Program, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, that did include a discussion about breastfeeding and in particular about how the program uh, does or does not support um, women who are on 
the program, you know, of course there are requirements that they are, you know, looking for a job or that they find paid work. And, and how does how does their uh, does that impact on their breastfeeding experience? What is their experience like in the, the particular programs, and how does that impact their breastfeeding experience? So definitely something that could be um, a great an investigation on your state level. Um, you know, of course it is implemented at the state level. What what is happening in your state welfare system for low income moms, um, and and how they are experiencing that program, and how their their breastfeeding support um, is being impacted. Um, so let's see. We have. It looks like we do have a, maybe a volunteer for the <laughs> um, for our. But yes, we're looking for folks who are interested in trying out that top 100 partners exercise and maybe looking at some of these opportunities for for new partners in your state. Um, another question. Um, can you also provide some examples of how shared measurement is applied, um, how that could be applied by a, a breastfeeding coalition? Um, or Sylvia, I don't know if you have any particular examples of shared measurement at, um, at, the, at the state or local level that, that could be relevant for, for our group? Um, not concrete examples from the breastfeeding field, but hypothetically, you know, I would say different ways in which I, you know, if I were in, uh, you know, working at either the state or the um, or the local levels, you know, some of the data that you spoke of already, you know, the uh, economic framing of 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 you know the the cost or the cost benefit to breastfeeding, how widely available are you making that known? To, to families and what other partners are engaging with families that you might want to empower with that information so that they can help you disseminate your message more broadly. Um, so measures I would be looking at would be, you know, what do we know about the current rates of breast, uh, breastfeeding in our state relative to other states? So, you know, um, you know and, and, you know, if there is, um, a positive difference in a neighboring state, do they have uh, more supportive legislation? That might be one I would be looking at. So how does how does our rate of breastfeeding differ? Um, would be one, uh, what is our current rate? Um, are there particular um, age cohorts or, um, you know, uh, different uh, neighborhood cohorts, different, you know, where is it different? Because I think one of the things, if you're really moving to a place of wanting to take action or needing to take action, you know, you don't have to sort of have your initiative blanket the entire state right at the get-go. So, you know, if there are, you know, you may want to go a deep dive into one jurisdiction where it's really high and see what, what's going on there, and then one where it's lower, um, and, and, you know, learn from that. Um, I, and then tracking change over time would be, you know, the other another key measure I'd be looking at. Um, sometimes when you're building a coalition initially, it isn't necessarily the data related specifically to the breastfeeding that um, that you would be looking at. You would be looking at things like how often is our issue mentioned in the media, or how many new partners have we been able to attract. Um, you know, what is the sort of growth of our database overall? There's, you know, so those are more um, progress markers, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, process and outcome. Yep. Yeah, but you need to, knowing that it can take three to five years to see a measurable change in a population level indicator, I think, mm -hmm. you know, in order to sustain momentum, to keep this work going, and to celebrate your progress, you know, you need to be looking at some of those process indicator changes as well. Um, yeah. And I, I, can, I will say um, the folks at FSG have um, re not if, well, a while ago now released a three-part guide to evaluating collective impact, which is quite, quite a good resource. And of the three-part guide, the third part of that guide actually has a number of sample indicators that you can look at awesome. because yeah. one of the things that's interesting is depending on the maturity of your collective impact effort you may be tracking different things so you'll be you know tracking different things at the startup of something than you would later on down the line yeah. when your collaborative yeah, effort is more mature 
That's that's a great a great thought because we're we're cer we certainly experienced that at USBC. I, I I would share that we we feel like the valuation section is probably the area where we have have gone least deep, you know, or stayed um, not not gotten as as much in depth with. But we definitely will have future webinars in this series where we talk more about evaluation, especially and how. Um, it, it relates to collective impact initiatives. We also, just a quick teaser, we'll be doing an evaluation um, topic for our Power Tools webinar series in December. Um, that's our capacity building series. But that, that will be more focused on traditional evaluation measures and, and what your, your funders might be looking for, um, a little bit more so than um, forming a shared agenda and, and shared measurement with other partners and stakeholders. Um, but one other quick thing to watch for, just a, a teaser of something that will be in tomorrow's weekly Wednesday Wire um, that, that Danae will also be sharing as a coalition tip um, in, in, our, in our new series is um, around the community health needs assessments. I think this could be another really interesting shared measurement opportunity for states. Um, I did not realize, just found out recently, that the Affordable Care Act actually requires all tax-exempt hospitals to conduct community health needs assessment every three years. So that means all of your tax-exempt hospitals are required to do these community health needs assessments. Um, and they just did a round of them last year. Um, so one partic particularly interesting idea for state coalitions could be to take a look at what came out of those in your states and communities. Are there opportunities for breastfeeding, opportunities to um, get, get in and connect to that for your hospitals and, and your communities? Could be a, a really great opportunity to connect to a, a shared um, change agenda and, and measurement agenda of, of the particular supports in your in your community. So a teaser for a topic to come um, in tomorrow's weekly Wednesday wire and we'll we'll try to, to think of some more of those ideas um, and and spread them. Um, but I know we're out of time for today. So we had some some great questions. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And again please um, do reach out to us. Um, you can just contact us at the office email, um, office at usbreastfeeding.org if your state might be interested in being an example and, and having us work with you on what's called the top 100 partners, doing an analysis of um, your, your partners at the table already and who else might, might be available to come to your table, um, please let us know. And we will look forward to talking with you online in the community as well as on our next webinar in, in December. So thanks again, Sylvia and Amelia, and we will um, take care and talk talk with everyone soon. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.